Good evening, everybody. Welcome to FSD Kenya's fifth annual lecture. The hashtag is FSD Lecture. I'm going to say that again. The hashtag is FSD Lecture. And because I'm, I'm still figuring out this social media thing, I'm going to take a picture of all of you. How do you what do you think? Yay. All right, let's see. You got one there. Uh, this one looks a little empty. Can you guys look full? I don't know. Great. So I'm Tamara Cook, and I had the privilege of receiving the mantle of leadership for, F from F for FSD Kenya from tonight's speaker earlier this year. We had a record number of registrations, over 500 people, and it looks like about half of you have showed up so far, um, from the financial sector, researchers, policymakers, regulators, fintechs, consumer associations, students. Um, we're delighted to have you here tonight. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our program investment committee members who are here, our trustees, KPMG, and our donors. The Department for International Development of the UK um, had the vision to create FSD Kenya 15 years ago, and the founder is here tonight. So Hugh, it's great to have you in the audience. Um, the Swedish International Development Agency and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are also our donors. FSD Kenya's long-term goal since its inception has been to generate sustainable pr improvements in the livelihoods of lower income households through reduced vulnerability to shocks, increased incomes, and employment. We do this by working with public and private players to create financial solutions that work for everybody. Earlier this year, uh, nine members of the broader financial inclusion community the the, of the FSD network um, created, came together to sign a charter to, to formalize something that was kind of already there. Um, FSD Network is a, is a coordination, coordinated body of nine members across the, the continent who all have a similar mission to FSD Kenya. And it's great to have um, some colleagues from FSD Africa here tonight. Um, FSD Africa is also based here in Nairobi and we um, enjoy working with them on many different projects. Part of the way that we seek to achieve the goals of FSD Kenya and the broader network is to inspire the financial market. And the annual lecture series is one of the ways that we have um, to do that. We've, this is now, as I said, our fifth annual lecture. And the first one was in 2015. It was given by Dr. Surrey, and it looked at the impact of mobile money. The second one was by Rafe Mazur and looked at consumer protection here in Kenya. The third one was by John Kay, um, a, a renowned economist from the UK, who talked about other people's money, making finance serve the needs of the economy. And last year, in this very venue, we were pleased to have Julian Kula, who, the founder of Mode, talking about fintech and its future. And he had hoped to join us tonight uh, on the panel, but uh, sent his apologies yesterday. So now it's my privilege uh, to invite uh, Dr. Not to invite you yet, sorry. To introduce Dr. David Ferrand. As I said, he le recently handed the leadership of FSD Kenya over to me in July. He, was, um, he has a very long history here in Kenya, um, having worked in, at Barclays and then studying for his PhD and doing his research here with the Institute of Development Studies at University of Nairobi, um, and then joining DFID uh, to work as a financial sector specialist and then finally coming to FSD Kenya. Now he works as a consultant and is actually doing some work with FSD Network um, and has been hired to be the convener of the FSD Network to help us figure out how to make this FSD Network work across the, the continent. So when I got this job, one of the very first things I did was ask David if he would deliver this lecture. Anybody who knows David knows that he prefers to be behind the scenes um, doing the hard work, but not necessarily up front. And yet he has so many interesting things to say. Um, and I, I think you'll, you'll find his reflections on these last few decades where he's been involved in the Kenyan financial sector very interesting. So as you can see, there's chairs up here and we have a very exciting panel. Thank you everybody who's come. Um, and during the lecture, you can tweet with hashtag FSD lecture any questions that you have both about David's uh, lecture as well as questions that you will have for the panel. We will curate those questions and consolidate them and then ask them to the panel towards the end. So again, tweet those at FSD Kenya, hashtag FSD lecture. And for those of you who are not on Twitter, feel free to write down your question and bring it up to the front. So in his characteristic humility, David introduced last year's lecture by noting that, quote, Several hundred people have not turned out on an evening, braving Nairobi's traffic in order to listen to me. Well, tonight, they have. 
And so it's my pleasure to turn over to the main event, uh, Dr. David Ferrand. Without further ado, and with all protocols observed, please join me in welcoming David to the podium. Thank you very much indeed, Tamara. You are too kind, I fear. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to come to this evening's lecture. Uh, I find myself in an unusual position, obviously, uh, having been involved in instigating the uh, public uh, annual lecture series at FSD, I now find myself at the sharp end of it. Uh, it's one thing to set up the aspiration for a lecture to tackle the cutting edge of the financial inclusion. Uh, it's rather another to try to deliver on it. I certainly feel honoured that Tamara has invited me to deliver this year's lecture, uh, but I do approach it with some trepidation given the exceptional lectures that we've had in the past. So thank you very much, Tamara, and I hope I can justify your braving the uh, uh, traffic this evening, everyone, uh, with, with these few thoughts. As we come to the end of 2019, we're reaching the halfway point for implementation of Kenya's long-term strategic plan, Vision 2030. The question is, can we benefit from a little 2020 hindsight next year as we look forward to how the financial sector uh, 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 needs to develop if we are to accomplish the goals of Vision 2030? Looking at Kenya's financial sector today, the standout success has clearly been in expanding financial inclusion. Revered around the world for the development of mobile financial services, M-Pesa has become a verb for payments. Building on this has been a tremendous burst of innovation. We now have many M's building on the mother M-Pesa platform. Beyond this, Equity Bank has become the exemplar of successful financial inclusion business strategies. Kenya has been among the first markets in Africa to issue green bonds, and the Nairobi Securities Exchange is the fourth largest on the continent. Nairobi, already a financial hub for the region is soon to set itself up as formally as an international financial center. But alongside the plaudits, there have been many challenges and criticisms. There have been several banking collapses over the past decade, although fortunately none in systemically important institutions. There's been widespread public concern over the price of financial services, with the banks bearing the brunt of the criticism. The result was that in Parliament uh, in 2016, interest rate controls were reintroduced, more than 20 years after, they had first, uh, after interest rates had been liberalized, and they have only just been repealed. Alongside this, there have been growing concerns over consumer protection, heightened by the new threats of the digital age. But taking a step back from the headlines and hyperbole, where are we today? And where should the financial system be going? Answering this very much depends on your frame of reference. So to be clear, my aim today is to look at this from the perspective of public policy. And for that, we need to turn to Vision 2030. Vision 30, 2030 is the government's formal expression of Kenya's development aspirations. I take that as a starting point. My primary focus is in what Vision 2030 has to say about national aspirations, rather than delving deeply into its underlying strategy for achieving them. A crucial point in Vision 2030 is that it recognizes the importance of growth, but does not unduly privilege it. Vision 2030 is based on three pillars, economic, social, and political. In this, it's strongly consistent with the international consensus encapsulated in the Sustainable Development Goals. These goals are the natural evolution of the human development approach pioneered by Amartya Sen and others 20 or 30 years ago. Recent work by Francis Stewart and others has demonstrated the vital connection between human development and economic growth. In short, we cannot have one without the other. And also, we need to keep in mind that the end ultimately is not growth, but the fulfillment of human aspirations. So just how important is finance in all of this? How do we achieve this complex and ambitious vision? 
Now, judging by the opinions of some of those in the financial sector, the answer is pretty important. Lloyd Bankfein, the CEO of Goldman Sachs during the global financial crisis, responded vigorously to mounting criticism of the financial sector and Goldman Sachs in particular. He justified the role that he put to the financial sector in relation to enabling investment to drive economic growth. We help companies to grow by helping them to raise capital. Companies that grow create wealth. This in turn allows people to have jobs that create more growth and more wealth. We have a social purpose. Cross-country studies and lots of econometric analysis have come to a broad, though not uncontested, view that financial sector development does indeed contribute to development. That's clearly great relief for people like me who have spent most of their professional lives working on that assumption. But more recently, reflecting the global financial crisis in particular, a note of dissent has crept in. And it is conceded that you can have too much of a good thing, very much a theme of John Kay's lecture two years ago. And in some countries, notably Britain and the United States, those financial sectors are now judged to have gone beyond the point which is optimal. The potential role of finance in contributing to economic and social empowerment gave rise to the microcredit revolution, which has evolved over several decades to become what today we've referred to as financial inclusion. So convinced was Mohammed Yunus by the impact of microcredit, drawing on his experience in establishing the Green Bank in Bangladesh, that he proclaimed that access to credit is a basic human right. The problem with that is that the evidence is now in, and it's become clear that microcredit has fallen far short of its putative role of a magic bullet that would put poverty into the museum. After several million dollars spent on the best economic research money can buy, the conclusion was that access to credit works very well and quite badly for a few, while for the majority it has very modest to no impact which was probably what a reasonably honest credit officer in a microfinance institution could have told you 20 years ago. So what is the role of finance? We need to take a step back at this point and ask, what is it for? There are various competing taxonomies on the functions of finance, but let me go back again to John Kay. We can look at four functions. Payments. Enabling of market trading, either face-to-face -face or, and of huge importance to most domestic and international trade, over distance. Intermediation between borrowers and lenders. Most importantly, allowing investment in the economy to generate wealth, as Mr. Blankfein suggests. Management of household affairs. Dealing with the need to manage our resources from day to day, year to year, and cradle to grave. And finally, managing risk from the routine events which compromise a business or households, from accidents or price movements to devastating losses from disasters. These functions are all clearly interconnected. Payments underpin the other three. Without a means to transfer value, intermediation cannot happen. And long-term flows between borrowers and lenders for enterprise financing is intimately tied up with the management of household affairs. Many people's pension contributions are reinvested in businesses. And risk is critical to both intermediation and the management of household affairs. These elements clearly go to the heart of cooperation in a society. It seems hard to imagine that finance could not be playing a huge role. But the suggestion I want to make this evening is that we need to pay much, much more attention to the quality of finance rather than its quantity. So with that framing, how well has Kenya performed over the last decade? Two crux issues are intermediation and household financial management, since these directly impact on businesses and people. The obvious area we expect impact on as is clear from the preceding, is growth. Kenya's growth rate over the last decade has improved, averaging 5.6% per annum in the decade 
to uh, 2018 against 3.6% in the decade before. But that, those figures are still way short of the Vision 2030 aspiration of 10% per annum. From a financial sector perspective, the key function we are looking at here is intermediation, mobilizing finance for investment. And the investment ratio is somewhat below the level sought in Vision 2030 of 30 to 32%. But crucially, the, sa the average savings rate remains below 10% against a target range in Vision 2030 of 25 to 28%. That's a huge shortfall. By comparison, taking Vietnam, which is a relatively fast-growing economy today, it has managed an investment ratio of 26% over the last decade and matched it with its savings rate. But this approach suggests a somewhat too static approach to growth. We know growth cannot just appear in response to a level of uh, financial resourcing. Productivity improvement is at the heart of unlocking inclusive, sustainable growth. Work done by the Harvard University's Growth Lab has demonstrated the importance of increasing national capabilities and know-how in order to improve productivity. This generally happens incrementally. Countries build on their existing capabilities in order to enter new economic sectors. The Growth Lab at Harvard has created the Economic Complexity Index in order to measure a country's productive capability. The index itself is based on data for product exports, but that correlates very strongly with services. Kenya has made very limited progress on improving its economic complexity over the last two decades. And again, using Vietnam as a comparator, the difference is stark. Vietnam has managed consistently higher GDP growth over the same period, and it is now better for positioned for sustaining future growth. The Economic Complexity in in Index not only correlates strongly with GDP growth, but is actually a strong predictor of future expansion. Now, whilst there are clearly very many variables at work here driving economic complexity, in aggregate, it at least raises the question of whether resources are being allocated optimally. In other words, is the quality of finance adequate? Turning to financial inclusion, the story from a quantity perspective seems unequivocally positive. The direction of travel has been so rapid that the prospects of full financial inclusion now appear well within reach. Indeed, it's been so successful that the big question that we worry about now in Kenya is what to do about those left behind. The Brookings Institution, in the latest report, confirmed Kenya's preeminence in the financial and digital inclusion program. It quotes, For the third year in a row, Kenya ranked at the top of the scorecard, driven by its robust commitment to advancing financial inclusion, widespread adoption of mobile money services among traditionally underserved groups, an increasingly broad range of mobile money services, including insurance and loan products, and an enabling regulatory environment for digital financial services. But the crux question is, what are the implications for impact on household fin financial management, the function that we're seeking to address here? This is about managing resources over multiple cycles, the day-to-day -day management of vital consumption expenditure, annual variations and between years, and the entire life cycle from birth education, through rearing a family, to retirement, and indeed for many, leaving a legacy for the next generation. And that's generally about achieving three things. Shifting resources through time, sometimes through saving, and occasionally through borrowing. Taking advantage of opportunities to invest in either oneself through education, or acquire crucial assets such as a house, or an enterprise, either your own or someone else's. Coping with the many uncertainties of life, illness, accident, robbery, and death. The positive news is that we do see evidence of how financial inclusion has been impactful. A very well-known longitudinal study of M-PESA, for example, revealed that it enabled households to manage risk better due to their strong connectedness to social networks. A more holistic measure of impact is provided by the concept of financial health. FSD Kenya has developed an index based on the FinAccess data set, which assesses the extent to which people are able to manage day-to-day, -day, cope with risk, or invest in future goals. 
Now, we only have data for two periods, but the results are not hugely encouraging. While between 2016 and 2019, financial inclusion continued to improve, we see financial health, health worsen. Now, we have to accept that there are many other factors potentially at play here. And these are ultimately based on subjectively reported measures. But GDP per capita did grow during that period. This tends to suggest that the benefits from this growth are not reaching the majority. Probing a little further, we find that the utilization levels of many formal financial services are still relatively limited. When it comes to dealing with the practical challenges of financial management, the current generation of formal financial services is still simply not sufficiently useful. In summary then, again, while we're making strong progress on quantity, there seems to way, a way to go until we achieve the quality of financial service provision needed. This rapid review of the state of play in Kenya suggests that there is a case for thinking carefully about whether we are on the right trajectory for creating the financial system we need. We need to take a, little, a step back a little again. So where are the challenges? If we're falling short, why is this? What are the drivers of the challenges in finance? We're seemingly doing well in Kenya, but not well enough. There are many financial problems we need to address in order to deliver the outcomes we're looking for in terms of growth and impact on people's lives. Uncertainty is the underlying practical problem in any financing arrangement. That's the core problem that finance has to address. What are the prospects that value will be generated? We can look at two major drivers of uncertainty. First, what time period are we financing over? And second, what's the degree of complexity inherent in it? The time element seems relatively intuitive. Providing a consumer with a short-term or ultra-short-term loan is a relatively tractable problem. But financing retirement is much longer term and harder to accomplish successfully. Complexity derives from a number of factors. A key driver is how many firms or people are involved in realizing value. How many things have to go right for the finance to be successful? What we've illustrated here thus far, at least from a transactional point of view, is relatively simple, involving bilateral arrangements. But add more players and the complexity and uncertainty increases. Where we get to a level where we are necessarily involving very large numbers of participants, and more pertinently, where there are public goods involved, the complexity becomes very high. So there are briefly two ways in which we can tackle that uncertainty problem. First, we can try to develop better ways to predict the future. And in banks, insurers, and investment companies, considerable attention is paid to developing models to reveal the future through either loan appraisals or behavioral scoring, actuarial modeling, and sectoral company research. Second, we can use institutions, rules of the game, to try to shape the future. Norms, contracts, regulations, and laws prescribe what should happen in the future. The strength of institutions can be measured by the extent to which they're enforced and do, in fact, shape the future. We can think of the capacity of the financial sector in addressing these problems of uncertainty in the form of a financial frontier, the limit at which we're able to provide financial, uh, viable solutions. Looking at all this complexity begs the question of how comprehensive financing is achieved anywhere. But I think we're probably asking too much of the formal financial sector. And here, I think it's important to distinguish between the formal financial system and the financial sector. Too often, these two are conflated. We need to look at the system at, in terms of at least four components. And I make no claim here that this is a definitive taxonomy. There may be better ways to classify. But what we have here are the formal financial sector, informal fin financing, state finance, and embedded finance. These together provide a potentially much richer set of solutions to the four functions discussed earlier and dealing with the challenges just outlined. Interestingly, even in the world's most advanced, financially advanced or financialized economies, all four are still found. Now, the first three of these categories are, at least in broad terms, probably 
fairly familiar to everybody and need little discussion. Embedded finance, I apply to forms of finance which are undertaken formally, but by non-financial organizations. This therefore includes two important and ubiquitous forms of financing. Self-financing within a firm or other organization, say through retained earnings and liquidity. And secondly, between firms, typically in tightly linked supply chains. Both forms of financing are of considerable significance. The boundaries between these four categories of finance are perhaps rather less well defined than it might appear. How much formal or informal influence must the state have to have over a, for a financial institution before it becomes defined as part of the state finance category, as distinct from the private financial sector? Suffice it to say, while the definitions can be and are made to establish those boundaries, there are inevitably, sh inevitably shades of grey. The supposition has long been that informal financing represents a necessarily less efficient form of financing. However, we see that informal financing continues to play a major role in Kenyan financing, despite the expansion of the formal sector. And it's also extremely significant in early stage financing in the world's most advanced economies. There are, of course, nefarious reasons for the persistence of informal finance. The lack of visibility of informal transactions is useful in supporting illicit flows. But there are many positive reasons. Where people know one another very well, far better than a third party, there can be significant transaction cost advantages. This is of particular importance in a country like Kenya, where many people and businesses continue to operate in the informal sector. Embedded finance doesn't tend to receive much attention. Examples that we have seen for a long time include outgrower schemes in which a large buyer finances production by smallholder farmers who are well known to one another. And this works well if there are strong and mutually advantageous relationships. But there are signs that embedded finance become, may be becoming much more significant with the rise of platforms. The world's two largest e-commerce platforms, Amazon and Alibaba, have both started to provide finance to small and medium enterprises using their platforms. These businesses have direct access to critical business data, enabling them to provide liquidity financing, which a bank would struggle to achieve. Recognizing that we are looking to build a financial sector, which is just one part of a much wider financial system, may be helpful in meeting Kenya's aspirations. I'd now like to turn to some implications for how Kenya could build the financial system that it needs to accomplish its vision. In doing so, it's vitally important that we're realistic about it. In thinking about the next decade of financial sector development, we need to look at what has been accomplished in the last. And indeed, with all due caution, the many decades prior to that, and indeed the experience of the rest of the world. This mustn't limit our ambition but we help us think more clearly about how to get there. My first proposition is that financial sector needs to solve real world problems. This could be regarded as either a tedious statement of the blindingly obvious or economic heresy, depending on where you stand. My intention is to be more the latter than the former. There is a great rush in Kenya towards expanding short term consumer lending fueled by ICT. Does this solve real-world problems? The answer is yes, sometimes. But sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it creates new and worse problems. If a family's problem is that it's too poor, then giving it the ability to shift the timing of small amounts of consumption is only exceptionally going to address that problem. So what does this mean? I'd argue a balance is needed. On the one hand, there's a danger of heavy-handed paternalism, whether emanating from a regulator, the financial sector, or social network, which limits people's ability to make choices. Results from the field show time after time that the real experts on living on little are not generally found in government departments, banks, or development agencies, but among the poor themselves, who have first-hand experience of doing it on a daily basis. But we also know from practical experience that people are neither omniscient 
nor always best positioned to make the optimal choices, especially when they are faced with the stresses created by trying to address the apparently intractable problems of poverty. They could do with a little help. And a lending app sitting next to an online betting app on a phone is not an instrument of empowerment. We know practically that for many young people, it will ultimately limit their choices, not increase them. So how do we achieve this? The answer, I'd argue, is not simply through regulation, though that will have a role to play. Rather, I think it's a question of enlightened self-interest. The long-term sustainability of financial institutions is based on the sustainability of their clients, whether businesses or people. If financial services are simply extracting value from their customers rather than helping them create real value, then this cannot be sustained in the long term. The most traumatic proof of that, of course, is with pyramid schemes, which, with which Kenya unfortunately has had first-hand experience. But unsustainable consumer lending is on the same spectrum, as has been demonstrated by banking collapses throughout the world. And South Africa provides the de uh, demonstration case on the continent. Long-term finance business strategy is about creating value for customers. The illustrations of this, in fact, are all around us. Equity Bank's astonishing success was founded on trying to solve simple problems for their customers, or members, as they prefer to see them. This is perfectly illustrated by one of their earliest customer solutions. The nature of the tea business is such that growers receive their payments in two parts, on delivery and when the final market price has been determined and settled. This creates a household liquidity problem for smallholders, who still need to live while they're awaiting the so-called bonus. Equity Bank introduced a very simple lending offer in tea growing areas, which allowed tea farmers to borrow against their deliveries and then repay it when the bonus was paid. Nothing very elaborate about that, but it was solving a simple real-world problem. Kenya's poster child for financial inclusion is obviously M-Pesa, and that was similarly based on solving a real-world problem. How do Kenyans working away from their families, typically in urban areas, get money back to support their families, very often in remote rural, rural areas? Perhaps my favorite illustration is from the energy field. The development of solar technology has made scalable so solar solutions a viable option for people living in areas beyond the power grid. But low-income people cannot afford the capital outlay for the solar devices, even though the depreciation on the equipment, with the running cost being taken care of by God, is significantly lower than the cost of kerosene, the usual alternative. M. Copa and others have developed a pay-as-you-go financing solution, enabling people to gradually buy, to buy a device as their cash flow permits. This is an example of embedded finance. The distribution of solar and other devices is driving the financial services here. This has enabled over 400,000 devices to be acquired to date. And the value created is not only in providing access to a cheaper form of light, but it's also significantly healthier and reduces carbon emissions. My second proposition follows directly from the first. As we look at the real world challenges Kenya faces, what stands out is the diversity. Kenya's challenges are not the same as the G7 countries or indeed the BRICS. We're looking for rapid change at a different point in history. E.F. Schumacher was famous for espousing small is beautiful, referring to the economic organization and the size of firms. But in fact, his argument was rather more nuanced than that. He was calling for a rebalancing. He observed that if there had been an overemphasis on small scale, he would have been first in line, arguing in favor of large scale. This seems pertinent here. Kenya already has significant diversity across its formal and informal financial sectors, encompassing formal institutions, banks, insurers, investment firms, pensions, mobile payments provided, and a rapidly expanding range of fintech built on it financial cooperatives and microfinance institutions, and informal groups and mechanisms. With each, each of these categories, is a surprising degree of diversity. And we haven't even talked about the other two categories of state finance and embedded finance, within which, again, there is considerable diversity. FinAccess 
show, data shows that people responded to the advent of an increasing range of financial solutions, not by and large by abandoning the old ones in favour of new, but in expanding their portfolios. Surveys on business financing suggest a similar story. The private providers of uh, financial solutions range. Informal solutions are an important source of startup capital, not only to the very many informal enterprises in Kenya, but also, again, to it, modern businesses. So why do we need this diversity? In short, these varying sources have widely varying strengths and weaknesses. Social networks can provide remarkably useful information about some aspects of individuals. And the fact that social networks are being digitized at breakneck speed is explaining the potential growth of platform providers in finance. Suppliers and buyers often know a great deal about the businesses up and down stream from them in value chains. Meanwhile, banks can provide the scale of finance necessary for business growth and investment. Capital markets help to lengthen the tenor and, and take investment risks. And finally, governments can make long-term commitments and bear uncertainty that the private sector cannot. But this is just looking at what varying sources of finance can do. We also need to consider incentives and motivations. Here, the spectrum of ownership is crucial. Financial service providers, which are owned by their users, have been a feature of financial systems since the 18th century worldwide. And they've been a part of the Kenyan landscape since 1964 in the form of financial cooperatives. And today, Kenya's SACOs form the largest financial cooperatives movement on the continent. The incentives of SACOs are necessarily different from a commercial bank. They exist sim not simply to make a profit for their shareholders, but to serve the wider interests of their member clients. From the perspective of the member clients, there's a benefit in not needing to pay returns to shareholders. They're paying the returns to themselves. And the relationship between SACOs and their members is usually different from that between banks and clients. This has implications for managing credit risk. Leveraging the social bonds and embeddedness within local communities has enabled SACOs to lend where banks have feared to tread. And well-managed SACOs have been a highly effective way of intermediating funds in key sectors where banks have not reached, notably agriculture. Now, that isn't to take a, a, a Panglossian view of the SACOs sector. There have been problems. They are prey to the principal agent problems we see in the banking sector just as much. As an organization grows, the challenges of member owners overseeing the management team increases. And so the introduction of prudential regulation in the sector has been an essential step. Financial service associations, or FSAs, I think are an interesting innovation in the form of the financial mutual in Kenya, which has grown quietly over the last decade. Member-owned and located in some of the remoter rural areas in Kenya, FSAs most closely resemble the notion of a village bank. The problem of increasing the sophistication of what services can be offered has been tackled by a novel solution. KREP Feather Services is a highly specialized business service provider which enables FSAs to outsource their management and operations, enjoying the efficiencies that that creates, while members retain ownership at a local level. And research has convincingly demonstrated the role, that the role of local financial institutions is very strong in stimulating local economic development. And that applies in countries like Kenya and in countries like the US. The KFS FSA model includes a strong degree of tacit oversight, helping to provide a cost-effective way of mitigating the problems of institutional capture to which such institutions are prey. The importance of diversity can perhaps best be seen when it's lost. Building societies in the UK were the, were the leading mutual form there, which whose origins go back to the late 18th century, created to enable their members to build houses. In 1986, the UK moved to allow building societies to demutualize if they so wished. This was driven by the policy aim of the then government to create a more competitive market-based financial system. As a result, societies representing two-thirds of the assets of the building societies movement elected to demutualize. All of these have now ended up as part of very large commercial banking groups. The story of Northern Rock starkly illustrates the cost. 
comprised of societies which had been in existence for nearly 150 years, Northern Rock demutualized in 1997 and floated on the London Stock Exchange. It dramatically shifted from its conservative business model and pursued aggressive expansion, writing ever more highly geared mortgages, which are financed through securitization and which in turn helped fuel the UK's unsustainable housing asset bubble. A mere 10 years later, the model unraveled in the 2007 financial crisis and the UK experienced its first bank run in 150 years. In order to avoid the very real risk of massive systemic impact, the Bank of England stepped in and the bank was nationalized. My third and final proposition is that the future is open. And I mean this in two ways. First, the future of the financial system in Kenya can take many paths. And second, that one of these paths could be to create an open financial system. Developments this century have made the idea of a convergence in economic and social models intellectually unfashionable. Francis Fukuyama's end of history appears nowhere in sight today. However, curiously, this notion of convergence seems persistent in relation to the financial system. The supposition appears to be that the end of financial history is the Anglo-American model, notwithstanding its manifest fragilities. But the notion that there is one model is simply not supported by the facts. We can compare here some very simple headline data on uh, uh, proxies for the relative roles of banks versus market financing in the world's largest financial systems. First, we see how relatively bank-led Japan and Germany are compared with the US and UK. And second, just how much change there has been in what is a relatively short period. Kenya and Nigeria had roughly similar levels of financial inclusion back in 2006, though uh, Nigeria's GDP per capita was more than double Kenya's. Since then, Kenya's inclusion levels have taken off, while Nigeria appears to have plateaued at a level just a little below 50%. Mobile money has been the driver of Kenya's success. And it's instructive to note that unusually among bank regulators on the continent, in 2007, the Central Bank of Kenya adopted a test and learn approach to allowing a mobile network operator, Safaricom, to develop a new system. By contrast, the Central Bank of Nigeria steadfastly maintains its insistence on a bank-led approach. So finally, let me turn to the notion of an open financial system. The technology of information is in the, information, it is in the engine room of financial services. And it scarcely needs repetition here that Kenya and the rest of the world is in the midst of an information technology revolution which is driving change at an unprecedented pace. Every aspect of information is undergoing change, from the collection of data, through the interpretation and processing, to its application and dissemination. The economies of scale inherent in the first generation of computer technology were a major force driving bank consolidation, at least in the retail space. But technology has changed again, and this is no longer the case. Indeed, being saddled with large-scale legacy technology is proving such of a handicap to banks facing competition from nimble-footed fintech fat challenger banks. An open financial system is premised on harvesting the possibilities this creates. It enables us to exploit the full breadth of options from a diversified financial system. We need not be limited by the constrained product models of commercial banks, the threat to small community-based financial groups of covariant risk, the resource constraints of new growth sectors which limit embedded financing, or the inability of the state to respond effectively to the market. Rather, it could, create, uh, could allow creative solutions which can combine the strength of all of these sorted sources and mitigate the weaknesses. Now, just to be clear, open finance is not about another round of deregulation. Ironically, as we've just seen, this led to a more closed than open system in the Western economies which drove it. We need to be on our guard against concentration. The much vaunted super platforms exemplified by Alibaba and Amazon offer a huge potential opportunity to finally tackle the challenge of financing small and medium enterprise effectively. 
This has been the holy grail of development finance for five decades. But the prospective market power they wield could precisely destroy openness. And closer to home, our current proto-super platform, M-Pesa, already wields enormous influence as to who plays and who does not in our emerging digital finance ecosystem. The first steps needed to enable the creation of an open financial system are already being seen around the world. New institutions, the rules of the game, and shared infrastructure are needed. In the UK, the Open Banking Initiative has translated the principle that people and businesses should own their own data into practical mechanisms to allow data sharing within the financial system. This is already stimulating a new wave of fintech innovation offering new financial solutions. In India, the stack is providing a new digital infrastructure combining layers which provide digital identity, payments, contracting, and records on an open basis. And very many jurisdictions now are experimenting with reg tech and sandboxes to develop regulatory regimes which will encourage innovation while protecting consumers, businesses, and the economy against new threats. But is this open financial system really possible? The extraordinary degree of concentration seen in technology with the rise of the super platform it, driven by network economics gives rise to a healthy degree of skepticism. But there is an example of an open network which operates at enormous scale and which involves the public and private sectors and ordinary citizens. Its operation is underpinned by crucial rules and standards and it's constantly innovating and evolving. But it's either owned by no one or, or perhaps by everyone. It's called the internet. Our aim is not utopia, which, as Thomas More, who coined the phrase, uh, pointed out, simply means no place. Rather, what we want is utopia, which means a better place. What a difference E can make. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for that very insightful. Please take a seat uh, on one of the panels. Um, I'm sure we learned very much um, from David's lecture. My name is Azat Sawara. I'm the economist at FSD Kenya. So now we're going to switch gear a bit, and we're going to have a panel of distinguished um, individuals that have made time to share their reflections on what David said, um, and also um, um, get questions um, broader, on the broader financial sector. So I would like now to invite the panel and welcome them. The first one is Sitoyo um, Lopokoyit, the Chief Financial Officer from Safaricom. Welcome. Um, we also have Nuru Mugambi, um, Director of Communications from the Kenya Bankers Association. Welcome. We also have Phyllis Wakiaga, who is the CEO of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. And then finally, we have Nia Shah, who is the Managing Director of Maitri Capital. Um, so I'm now just going to take a seat and we'll get along with the panel. So I think I just want to start with, first of all, David, you had a lot in that that I think was very thoughtful. And, and I think I, it would be great to get some of the initial reactions from the panel. Um, I think, Niha, we'll just sort of start with you. You obviously are the managing director of Maitri Capital. And I think you look at sort of the investment landscape and the needs of um, um, SMEs, in particular in Kenya. Can you maybe share something that really stood out for you from, from what David said? I think one of the closing remarks that David made was that um, finance is open, or there's an openness. What's happening in, in Kenya, specifically in the SME industry, is that with technology being available, uh, a lot of financing opportunities are now being made available or accessible because the internet is there. So people can, can look online, look for particular grants that are specific to their sector. They're able to access venture capital financing because they're now aware that there are over 250 venture capital firms operating across all of Africa. Some of them are sector specific, some of them are open. Um, so openness, internet, has given a lot of resource that is now enabling finance to actually reach the destination. It's enabling entrepreneurs to access finance. Maybe, maybe 
So I'll ask the same to you, Phyllis. And of course, you come from the manufacturing sector, and you're well aware, of course, that we are deindustrializing as, as the Kenyan economy. So, so what stood out for you um, with David? Uh, thank you very much. I think I enjoyed David's talk. I put down what I think stood out for me. Uh, one of the things was the need to pay attention to the quality of finance rather than the quantity. And then the point he made about financial inclusion, and it showed on the graph, that as financial inclusion improved, the financial health was. So just interesting to try and figure out what, what is that about? Is it because the productivity is not increasing or the trickle down effect is less? So that, that stood out for me as a curious point. And then the other issue that the financial sector needs to solve real world problems. So I think coming from the manufacturing sector, uh, what would that mean that the financial sector should be designing products that actually solve the problems of manufacturers by understanding the sector maybe and trying to design products that are relevant to the sector. And just to emphasize on that, the issue he mentioned, that diverse problems need diverse solutions. So the ability of uh, uh, finance to be developed based on the need. Uh, if you look at manufacturing, trying to develop a blanket product for manufacturing wouldn't be a solution. Because even within manufacturing, there's diversity, whether it's within the sectors, the size, sometimes even the business owners, uh, in terms of maybe the gender of the business owners. We've done some work where it's, it's, it's been seen that sometimes maybe female business owners will borrow less and have other ways of, of raising their financing. So just being diverse in terms of uh, the products we offer. It was a very pragmatic and balanced conversation. And uh, there were three things that really stood out for me. And one was this issue around embedded finance and the potential of your pay-as-you-go systems, which, as we know, the mobile phone and, and the fact that internet is becoming cheaper and more accessible, um, the smart devices are also becoming more accessible. Therefore, we should see more innovation, not only in the energy sector, but I, I definitely believe also in the water sector. And even in the informal settlements, something as simple as pay-as-you-go toilets. Um, Safaricom is doing some interesting work as pay, uh, under pay-as-you-go healthcare. So I think um, the embedded finance is, is a new space that we should see a lot more um, innovation, which will create shared value. The other conversation or point that he raised was, and it is a concern for me personally, is the savings rate. Um, I, I think uh, as an economy, we really should be concerned um, at the fact that um, our national savings rate is, is, is decelerating. Um, but meanwhile, <laughs> the irony is financial inclusion is increasing. So this issue about financial literacy, this issue about income, um, financial health as we're now calling it, which in my opinion is around financial capacity. So not only do you understand and can access the product, but can you use the product to your advantage? And to me, that is what financial capacity is. And then finally, uh, a point that came out in his presentation, and I was just talking about this with a professor from Edinburgh University, is the fact that we don't do ourselves enough justice talking about the Kenyan story and the success story. So we might point to one or two examples, but when you look at our financial services sector, as you raised today, it's so diverse and it's so rich. Um, and I think by and large, it's a very responsive financial sector. Um, and and I, think, I, I think it's something that we could um, probably do more justice in telling the story of the Kenyan financial system? Two things stood out for me. One is on financial health. I think financial inclusion, we've it's moved from 23.6% uh, 20, in 2006 to 83% uh, formally financially included. But financial health is the ability uh, for people to... Today, let me just put this, today, if you have a daily issue that's been solved relatively well, whether with a digital credit or you can actually uh, create a short-term pay bill and solve those problems. But I think the long-term, and that's what you're talking about, is something that we need to do more. Uh, you talked about savings, we talked about wealth management, we need to talk about insurance, and we need to look at how uh, the technology out there um, can be used uh, to actually improve on financial health. Uh, the three things, the three propositions, which is basically solving real-world problems, the diverse problems, 
and the future is open is very, I mean, those three are spot on. But I'm really looking at the case of small business owners in Kenya and the fact that they do continue to struggle to get long-term patient capital, particularly from domestic sources. Um, and really, since you're in that space, can you sort of, sort of explain why that is? And what are your recommendations in terms of really channeling long-term patient capital to that sector? So let's step back and, and really determine what is patient capital. So patient capital, by definition, is capital that is long-term and capital that has an appetite for high risk. Traditionally, in, in the Kenyan society, if you have any spare income, um, so investment, you would put it in real estate, which is safe. You would put it in bonds. You would put it in equities. Investing into SMEs, which is more venture or angel, you would do it as a, as a friend, as a, as a mother, or as, as family. But it's not a class on its own. It's, it doesn't have the volume. When we're trying to solve problems related to patient capital, so be it long-term infrastructure, social infrastructure, social enterprises, like she mentioned in the water sector, where you're not going to see the returns for a very long time, where is that capital going to come from? And that is the real question. Where is that patient capital coming from? To date, a lot of that patient capital is coming from NGOs, foundations, um, maybe uh, development finance institutions like the DFID, like the CDC. But why can't we have it internally within our domestic economies? And there are, there are a number of ways that this is developing. So some of the ways that we can have that domestic capital, patient capital domestically is, we have a really budding um, entrepreneurial ecosystem. We're now developing companies that we're taking globally. So take Safaricom's M-Pesa as one of the first ones. We've now got Cellulant, who has gone and raised over $100 million over a number of rounds. We've got Africa's Talking, we've got Twiga, where we've just had Goldman Sachs put money into. These are success stories that are being read worldwide. They're success stories that entrepreneurs locally are looking up to. Why don't we take some of these entrepreneurs from these success stories and put back into the ecosystem? It's exactly how the Silicon Valley started. It's exactly how India back in the 19, um, in the 2000s during the dot-com boom started and started putting back into the ecosystem. They've already taken the risk to build these very large enterprises. They know where the hurdles are. They can be the role models into bringing this patient capital back home. So that's the new entrepreneurs. We also have the old entrepreneurs. We have um, Equity Bank James Mwangi. We have Chris Kurubi. And they are doing stuff back home, you know, bringing capital, investing in SMEs, but why not make it formal? Why not shout about it? Why not create success stories around it so that others can follow? Why can't, we be, why can't it be fashionable like it is in the Silicon Valley? The second one is leveraging on diaspora income. So Africa as a whole has about $160 billion of diaspora money coming into Africa every year. Kenya alone has about $2.8 billion. That is a lot of money. And usually that money comes back to pay for a number of regular needs, education, healthcare, um, telephone bills. But that money is coming through channels like technology channels these days, like World Remit. Why can't we use that, some of that diaspora money to put back into SMEs in a, in a more formal way? Exactly, and I think just to build on what you're saying, Phyllis, I want to sort of look into the manufacturing sector specifically. Um, I think everybody, you know, certainly whether it's private sector, government, development organizations, all know how important the sector is, and yet we know it's struggling. So I really want to understand, first of all, what type of financing typically targets the manufacturing sector? And, and sort of secondly, is it working, is it not working, and what does that look like? I think manufacturing is... Uh part of a lot of the conversations around Vision 2030, the Big Four Agenda, and really a sustainable way to grow the economy. Uh, in order to do that, one of the key things, of course, is financing. So in 
terms of the type of financing manufacturing needs, because manufacturing as a sector is very capital intensive, it definitely needs uh, high amounts of financing. It needs long-term financing because uh, investment in manufacturing requires time to be able to set up and pay back on the investment. It also requires affordable financing. It would also require grace periods uh, for before repayment because uh, normally if you're investing in a project, it would take a year, two years to finalize the project. By the time you get that running and uh, profit coming into the farm, it means uh, you would require a grace period within which uh, you, can, you can make the investment. So currently in the country, uh, w what is happening is that about 90% of financing in terms of uh, loans is coming from commercial banks. Uh, we have maybe 0.5% coming from the institutions set up by government. That's the IDBs, ICDC, and uh, other, other institutions. And then uh, in, in the same regard, we also have uh, financing coming in form of equity uh, into, into, into the farms. We've seen also DFIs uh, supporting and funding the manufacturing sector. Uh, that's, that's another area. Uh, where we see the gap is, uh, first of all, the cost of finance uh, for, for, for the sector. We also see a gap in manufacturing SMEs uh, being able to access uh, affordable finance. So just creating uh, products for the SMEs in manufacturing and uh, making financing available to them and affordable financing. The work around how do we uh, have business development programs or programs that support SMEs in manufacturing uh, to grow their businesses in a way that makes um, them attractive to banks. So as banks are lending to them, they view them as less risky. And I think one of the frank concerns Kenyans have is, number one, will the banking sector start lending to small business again? Because obviously, over that cap period, we saw a contraction in that lending. That's number one. And then the second concern will be the price of that lending. This issue of access versus cost. Okay, so the cost of capital versus accessing the capital. And um, indeed, we saw uh, a reduction in uh, bank lending to uh, certain segments of the private sector. Um, indeed, the SME sector was one of the areas where we saw a contraction in bank lending because of this issue of pricing um, the risk. Therefore, we, we do anticipate that since um, the law has now been removed, um, the, the industry will be better placed to start engaging with their clients uh, in terms of um, adequately pricing the, the cost of capital. I think what's interesting to note is that as much as cost and access of capital is an issue for SMEs, if you look at some of the research from KNBS in terms of what, is, what are the big challenges facing the SMEs, um, one of them is really this issue of navigating their market. I'll give you an example of a friend of mine who, she's amazing. So she owns a salon, a restaurant, and she fixes roads. <laughs> and, and, and she didn't go to school to do an MBA degree, or she's not a stylist. She didn't go to beautician school. She's certainly not an engineer. But she got into the business because, or the three businesses, because she saw an opportunity. And a lot of SMEs go into business because they see an opportunity or they need income. They're not necessarily in it because they're the technical experts in that space. And because of that, there is that capacity issue. Okay, So there is that capacity issue. So when you're trying to access finance, um, we always say there are these five C's in credit, and one of them is your capacity uh, to generate the income to help you service the loan. So that issue about capacity is a big issue that I think when it comes to pricing risk, um, it's, it's something that we need to address and, and I know we're trying to do this through KBA. The government is also has many uh, good programs around trying to build SME capacity. And the reason why it's important is because it addresses this perceived risk. But then at the same time, there is the real risk that also has to be priced. We all know that the lifespan of small businesses in this market is about 3.8 years. So no wonder the lending um, and the funding model is more self-funding um, and short-term lending because of that risk around um, the fact that most businesses might not reach their fourth birthday. 
Um, so I think these were all these dynamics, that's why I'm saying it's an industry debate that continues. Because just because we've removed the cap doesn't mean we're addressing all these issues. I think what we definitely are addressing is the access issue, uh, but the pricing issue is, uh, is still being engaged. Um, the central bank has introduced uh, uh, a framework called the, the banking sector charter, and the charter is now ushering in um, a, 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 a practice of risk-based pricing, where you now have to, as a lender, really pay attention to your customer at the individual level. It's no longer portfolio-based lending, it's client-based lending. So should we see increased lending in the market? Yes, we should, because the market has now been liberalized. Um, how quickly would that happen? We don't know yet, because of course there are market dynamics. I think if you look at the NPLs, that's also a concern. Thank you. And now I'll go to you, Satoya. And I think one of the emotive issues that have come up certainly this year is digital credit. And I think, you know, certainly FinAccess, you know, we gave um, as FSD sort of our thoughts around that. Um, so I really want to unpack your thoughts around sort of the motivations that Safaricom had around sort of launching Fuliza, also Digifarm that maybe, you know, people may not necessarily be aware of, and why, you know, Safaricom decided to make that play. Thank you. I think. Just before I start, I think from the SME side of it to the manufacturing side of it to the banks, I think we're in a unique position in enabling, providing uh, relevant data sources to, so that you can look at your friends so or the credit guy can look at your friend and not just see the capacity that he has, but the information that, that we can share for the person to be able to give credit. So I think there's a lot more collaboration we can do in terms of that. Uh, what is manufacturing today, EABL, over 90% of uh, Diageo's uh, supply chain goes through M-Pesa. So today we can be able to give the manufacturing sector, the cement sector, because they're using and they're collecting funds through M-Pesa to, to, um, uh, uh, to reduce the cost of uh, transit in cash, uh, the insurance and so on and so forth. For SMEs, uh, just watch this space uh, in the next couple of months because there's a lot that's going to come in with over 200,000 SMEs that use Lipa 9 Pesa. And we look on, we're going to be looking at how that can, uh, we can, we can uh, help in that space. Uh, we are very happy to see what the banks have done with Stawi at 9%. I mean, that's a tremendous product. Um, it, it, it's just to see how uh, they'll push it. But when it comes to digital credit, uh, first, let me start by the ethos of Safaricom. As a lot of people see the product and don't see what Safaricom does. Uh, Safaricom is, when we say we're a purpose-led organization, we truly mean it. Uh, when we say we're here to transform lives, it, it is there. It is a KPI that we have. Uh, when we've embedded our, the SDG goals, in it, my bonus is pegged on SDG goals, not on revenue. Uh, and, in, and it is something that is deep in, rooted from the time Michael started the company. Uh, we would not go to a town and put up a base station before uh, we had put up a health facility, uh, a well, a community health center, and so on and so forth. So we believe first is if the community is health, if the community is prosperous, then we'll be prosperous. I can tell you when you launch Fuliza, there's no business case. There's no ROI. We do not look at a product like that that we know that it's going to impact on society and put a business case to it. If I put a business case to it, it'll never go live. Even the finance guys uh, around the table will, will shut it down. So when we started uh, in 2012 with Mshuari, it was a savings-led credit proposition. You actually need to save to be able to get access to credit. Today, uh, uh, Mshuari has more savings than credit. And, that, and probably that side of the story is not told enough. But there's more savings than credit uh, on that. And the reason, actually, when we wanted to launch Mshuari, the day of launch, we wanted to convert all bank balances on M-Pesa to the bank balance and make financial inclusion that time we had, I think, 14.6 million customers real on day one. And the only person who stopped us was Central Bank saying, okay, you're no longer a payment, now you're going to be a bank. Um, so, so the, and that's why the opt-in process came. And when we asked Central Bank to give a, a no-objection letter to opting, electronic opt-in, 
it opened access not only to Mshwari, but today over 40 million bank accounts have been opened, and the banking industry is the biggest beneficiary of Mshwari opening. But the purpose we were, we were trying to solve is the shocks that we had seen from the time of Kenyans for Kenyans uh, issues, and the time, and let me give an example. So I grew up in Langata, and the ac only access to credit was when you want, it was mainly the shopkeeper. And it's still the biggest, even FSD says, it's, uh, the report says it's, it's the biggest access to credit uh, for, for, for Kenyans, is your shopkeeper, because you borrow and you pay when you have it. And we wanted to stop that embarrassment of people and you're passing the shop, and you're going home and you, you not pay the shopkeeper, so you try to use a different route. And, and the reason was we wanted to make it private. If you saw so the way we, we launched Mshwari was a mattress and the money under the mattress, and it was a hilarious. It was just saying everything needs to be private. Your friend went to, to the credit office, and I'm sure when she's going there, she's got a best dress, she's dressed up, got a, you know, a nice handbag and briefcase and all that stuff. With them, sorry, we were saying it's a private thing. I can borrow at home, and no one needs to know, and I don't need to be embarrassed. So we've, we started that, then went into uh, KCB, M-Pesa, uh, and th then digital lending now came, came through. And I, to be honest, uh, Kenya started it, and I was, as I said, in Singapore, everything is about digital credit in the world. Let's also give up give credit to what happened in Kenya that that's now the biggest thing. Alibaba, which just, I mean, Ant Financials, is only five, six years old. Everything they're launching has been launched in Kenya. There's nothing new. So give credit to the fintechs in Kenya for, for, for doing a tremendous service and actually <laughs> changing the world. Yeah? When you look at Revolut, I know you talked about open banking, David. Revolut is, I'm sure, in 2012. There's nothing Revolut has done that's, that's stunning. It's just that the law in the UK now has come, and fintechs have, are playing a really good role. But there is, there, there is stuff that is happening in Kenya. But I don't know how we, we, we can get our fintechs and our startups to actually get the credit that, uh, or the venture capitalists to put in the same amount of money that somebody who can come from Silicon Valley and set up in Kenya and get two, three hundred million. But a Kenyan who has developed this cannot even get a million Kenya shillings to, uh, to grow their business. So I think the, when we look at uh, digital credit, so let me give you an example, Fuliza. So if somebody can Google the first overdraft ever done in the world it was in 1728 by the Royal Bank of Scotland. The first contextual overdraft on a mobile phone was done in Kenya on 5th January. So let's give ourselves credit for changing <laughs> something that has never been done. The thought process behind Fuliza was there were 11 million transactions failing every single month on M-Pesa because of insufficient funds. That was 50 billion Kenya shillings on a monthly basis not being addressed. People were trying. Maybe somebody was paying a hospital bill. There was something somebody was trying to do. Now we've dropped that from 11 million transactions being failing to 2 million transactions failing uh, on a monthly basis. So we've, act and this is, Fuliza is, is a contextual. So you can't use it for, to withdraw money. You can't borrow it to do something else. You must be sending money to, to somebody. You must be paying a bill. You must be doing something else for you to be able to get access. And Fuliza is not just about um, when you have insufficient funds, like you're on zero or something. It's even when you have excess, you can go 50,000 and you want to pay something for 55,000, we, we provide you with that. And that has helped cushion uh, the day-to-day the -day, uh, challenges that uh, we do have. Agriculture is the backbone of Kenya. So Digifarm is connecting farmers to the buyers. So today, for example, we are going to Diageo, um, Bidco, and we're asking them, how, what, what kind of barley do you want? What kind of sunflower seeds do you want? What's the standard? Then we have gone round over a million farms in Kenya, going, measuring the farms, measuring the soil content, and then identifying which farms, farms can be used to plant, let's say, for example, sunflower seeds, and then telling them this is the price that's guaranteed in the marketplace. Plant for this, and you guarantee, we guarantee you um, the market. In addition, now we provide now financing for the fertilizer, for seeds, and sustain the farmer until they're paid. So 
for us, it's, it's always trying to solve, as David said, the needs that are there in the society. There's, there's not a product that we put out there for the sake of actually um, generating profits. The reason we put it is actually transform lives. But Fuliza took us less than 24 hours to have 1.2 million customers. We never advertised Fuliza for six weeks. And by that time, we had 4 million customers and over $60 million out there. And today, it has an NPL of less than 0.3%. That's unheard of in any country worldwide in terms of the NPL. And this is just about data. Thank you. I think that's important because I think, and David, please do feel, feel free to step in whenever. Um, I'll just ask another round and then I think we'll open to the floor. Do you want to say something, Ray? Um, and I'm obviously very excited by the possibilities of technology in, in terms of solving our financing needs. Um, but, I, but at the same time, we, we also need to sort of look at the big picture. And, and remember, um, at independence, there, were, um, there was another K, which was South Korea, which had a GDP per capita the same as Kenya at that time. And, and you know, we don't need to, to, we don't need the numbers. We know, we know what those histories have, how they've diverged. Um, and so I think, you know, we've got to remember that in a, in a sense there are some orthodox problems here, that there's a resource allocation issue that has to be solved by the financial system. And I, I emphasize system, it's not all on the sector. And I think, I think that's a problem that we've got, that we think it's all the responsibility of the sector and it's not. Um, so if we go back to, to, you know, the divergence between Korea and Kenya, a lot of it was because Korea was making better long-term resource allocations. Fundamentally, and that's why I think we, we need to be looking at things like economic complexity. So I'm not even 100% sure that we're not barking up the wrong tree when we're talking all the time about SME. SME is important, but in a way I think it's a symptom rather than the underlying problem. What do we need to do in order to develop the sectors which are going to raise Kenya's productivities? And to do that, we need to invest, and we need to invest long term. Banks can go so far, but they can't be expected to coordinate infant industries. This is not feasible for a, for a, for a commercial bank to do that. And so we come back to, to something which is not very fashionable to talk about, which is the state. Um, and, and certainly in Korea and, and the fast-growing economies of Asia, the state has played a role. And the state is able to bear uncertainties that the private sector is unable to do. Now, that's not to say that we should forget the state failure. There's been enormous problems of state failure. Much of the market failures are state failures. And, and, you know, again, we don't need to revisit the experiences of the development finance institutions. We know how, how, you know, some of those went off track. But I think what we should do is remember that the state does have a role for long-term investment. And we need to think, well, how can we build on the mistakes of the past? How can we get the governments right? How can we actually meld the various elements of the financial system together in a more creative way? which can solve this fundamental resource allocation problem a bit better than we've done uh, uh, in the past. I just want to emphasize, let's not forget the old problems. They haven't gone away. So I think in terms of we're looking for new solutions, we can't, we can't assume that technology is simply going to solve everything uh, at a stroke. We still have to deal with building Kenya's economic competency, its, its capabilities, and that requires long-term investment. And, and I think we've got to find ways to bring the state and private sector in, uh, uh, together in finance. You talk about the financing, but what is the ecosystem? Because, I mean, often you find that even when an SME or whatever does get access to financing, it may not have that catalytic effect that it necessarily could have if there was a healthier ecosystem of factors. So in your view, like, what does that really look like? I think you're absolutely right. You know, even if SMEs do get access to financing, um, the stats are, you know, one in nine will actually uh, succeed. The rest won't. Um, working capital issues, inability to manage working capital is, is you know, as, as my banking friends will know, is one of the core reasons why SMEs fail. So even after they've accessed financing, what can be done to help them grow their businesses and one of the key aspects is, is technical support. So what does technical support look like? Um, from a banking perspective they have a technical assistance facility which could be provided to them at, at a very, if, if not free, at a very cheap rate and that is access to uh, legal advisors, access to financial advisors who can 
guide them on how, how to build strong business models where the financing, this, this expenditure for financing is well thought through. They can hire really good, um, with the help of technical support, uh, sales strategists that can help them with where is my best value for every shilling spent coming from? Should I just you know, put out a, a Facebook ad or am I better off doing word to word, word, word on word referrals? So that technical support, which a lot of, uh, I would say, DFIs are coming out with, is really assisting SMEs. Um, I know the government is doing a lot around the technical assistance facilities with the various banks. Um, the banks are in increasingly using that with their credit lending. The other thing is, is the networks. Um, we have a lot of accelerators, incubators, uh, coming and setting up in Kenya, global incubators. We have the iHub, we have the Garage, we have many others. Antler is one of the newest entrants here. These are building ecosystems that have worked worldwide, be it in the Silicon Valley, be it in, in Israel. Business is done person to person. It's relationship-based, it's trust-based. When I need a lawyer, I'll call up a friend. And that's exactly how businesses succeed. Um, so that ecosystem building, which goes back to my earlier point of people who've made it or have seemed to made it, plowing back into the earlier budding ecosystem really does help, having strong mentors. And these are all soft skills. So success to SMEs is not just about financing. A lot of it is about persistence, it's about the softer side of it, and the mentoring, the ecosystem that you talked about plays a really strong role. Absolutely, and Phyllis, I, I want to sort of follow that into the, the manufacturing sector. I mean, certainly, you know, from the, we're getting, you've given us a sense of the type of financing you think um, would work for the, finan uh, for the manufacturing sector, sort of you're a convener of, you know, the manufacturing sector, which is significant in Africa. So what sort of role do sort of business bodies have? Because whether it's formal uh, business bodies or informal, both in the manufacturing sector, there is, a, there is this sort of mentality of associations in Kenya. So what role do you play as CAM in terms of being that intermediator for financing? And how do you think, you know, that can be built on even in, in informal manufacturing? As an association, one of the key roles we play is advocacy. So the role in policy advocacy can't be underscored because I think Dave has said something important, that the government does have a place to play in this uh, because for SMEs or for really that patient, long-term, affordable capital, you would need government to come in because it's not very feasible for commercial banks to lend at certain rates. But government for priority sectors, for reasons that include job creation and economic growth, would come in to uh, play a role. So I think the advocacy role is one of the areas we, we have played in. And uh, the creation of, let's say, the Biashara Bank or the Kenya Development Bank that's bringing together ICDC, IDB, and the Kenya Tourism Federation. And Biashara Bank, I think, is bringing together the Uezo Fund, Youth Fund, and Women Fund. It's part of those advocacy initiatives to say, what can we do for the sector? Uh, the other role we have played is to partner with the uh, development uh, partners to develop uh, programs to support manufacturing sector, especially in the green growth space. So there's a program we have been running called the Sustainable Use of Natural Resources and Energy Finance that has played within the green financing space. So working with the development partners to identify uh, projects in renewable energy and energy efficiency activities and uh, this uh, has been able to finance a lot of projects uh, within the manufacturing sector at affordable rates. The role we've played is given the technical uh, support to the banks to work with the businesses, carry out feasibility studies of their projects, and give certificates confirming that they're ready for financing. So that's one of the roles we play. Uh, I think there's also a role uh, that we, we are now appearing to want to play in where we can look at Industry 4.0 and the issue of technology upgradation. Uh, there is definitely the, the, the issue that technology is really going to be your next competitive advantage. So for the manufacturing sector to get to where we want it to, upgrading technology, investment in uh, new 
new technology areas and digitization is going to be a central part. So the role we can play in linking uh, manufacturing sector to financing to help them upgrade technology. And I know we've had conversations, we're having even a session with IFC at the end of the week. Uh, we've talked to the new DFID project, Invest Africa, where they're looking at investing in the manufacturing sector on the role we can play. Then there's the issue of uh, SMEs in manufacturing. Uh, there what we have done is uh, run what we call a business growth program, tailor-made for manufacturing, to build what Nuru called the C, the capacity of, of uh, manufacturing firms. So we run a module, uh, seven module program focused on manufacturing SMEs, where we work with them on developing their business plans, looking at their product development, export market development, good manufacturing practices, financing for manufacturing. So all these programs are just made to, t I mean, tailor-made to support those SMEs to be ready to uh, absorb financing. So as a BMO, we are, are playing all those roles and just trying to ensure that everything we do is geared towards building a competitive and sustainable manufacturing sector, even as we compete with the rest of the world. Thank you. And, and I want to get into that with you, sort of looking at how do you drive finance into certain segments? And, and I use the word segment very, very cautiously because we're going to talk about women in youth now. And I think we get a bit frustrated being thought of as a segment, and, you know, we're sort of half and youth are like 80% in this segment. But um, thinking about that, like, there are unique needs that I think whether it's women in business or young people, and given the demographic reality of Kenya, this is a massive market. Um, what is your thinking around the type of financing that women need, um, the type of financing that youth need? Um, why aren't they getting that type of financing? And sort of what do you think feasibly is the banking sector's role in meeting the financing needs of, of women and youth in particular? What I can say is um, there's lots of research in terms of um, how women customers borrow and access financial products vis-a-vis -vis male customers. Um, one of the recent studies that was done was by New Faces, New Voices, and we found that women just opt not to borrow because they feel that the collateral requirement or the many questions they'll be asked, whereas a man is more likely to borrow, um, even if he might not need the capital. It's really interesting, and, and in terms of where women get information when they're making financial decisions, a lot of women will self-learn, whereas male borrowers will ask. They'll ask their peers, they'll ask their coworkers, they'll ask other people who have borrowed, they'll walk into a bank and ask. So I think what that points to is the, the cultural context of how um, we make financial decisions. And there is actually a dichotomy between male borrowers and female borrowers. But to me, what's more interesting is that once a woman actually decides to borrow, her performance on that facility is better than a male. So the non-performing rate performance for women is lower than males. So women are more purposeful in terms of how they access capital. Um, the likelihood of them diverting that funding to alternative reasons is lower than with the other gender. So I think for us as an industry, it's really starting to understand um, our customers better and really understanding the social cultural dynamics that influence how people access our products. Um, and, and, and therefore, a lot of it has to do with the technical assistance side of finance. It's not just about price and access. It's about the support you give. And I would argue that banking is becoming a commodity and therefore the comparative advantage is about that value add. It's not just about getting finance. Now for youth, um, I, think, I think the issue is what I was talking about earlier about perceived risk and, and real risk. Now, if the average business in this country only survives 3.8 years and more than 60% of those businesses will close by their second birthday, when you walk into a financier's office to borrow or access the mobile platform to borrow, then these are those points that the system will look at in terms of pricing the risk. And obviously, the younger you are, there is a perceived higher risk. Um, so I think uh, the, the fourth industrial revolution and use of technology can help improve um, lenders, and I'm not just talking about banks, I'm talking about all lenders, lenders' ability to, to really start tracking and getting data on their individual customers, whether or not they're 
40 years old or 20 years old and really understand their, their, their risk from a cash flow perspective, from a behavior perspective. In China right now, um, they're piloting this issue of the social credit score. So depending on how you drive, be, depending on how you behave in public transport, it either improves or makes your credit score worse. So if you look at those types of algorithms that are being used to price credit, then you can say then probably younger, nicer people will get better credit than old grumpy people. <laughs> <laughs> so there is that uh, role that technology will be able to play, I think, to level that playing field in terms of access to finance. Great, and that just segues into the question I had for you, Satoya, which is sort of obviously as a PESA, you have this massive amount of data that I think a lot of financiers would find very useful. And sort of, I have a twofold question. First of all, what are your thoughts and thinking around how you can deploy that to create financial solutions, not just a Safaricom, but really financial solutions for Kenyan people? And then secondly, all of this data that you know, Safaricom now has, how are you sort of linking that to a broader agenda around inclusive economic growth and, and sort of equit equitable development in Kenya? In the formal, let me call it real formal, in the banking sector, the women are not brave enough, but I can tell you uh, in Fuliza last month, because we track all this, 72% of Fuliza credit was actually taken by women. So there's something, maybe it's a different channel that we need to look into uh, to, to empower them more. So uh, it's interesting to see how the different data sets can actually be used to solve some of the problems. I think the, 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 the third proposition for, for David on the future is open is something that we, we really take. I think there's a perception that we are closed uh, as Safaricom in terms of uh, how we operate or MPES operates. To be honest, as I said earlier on, MPES is an open platform. Uh, if you look at Mshuari, it's in collaboration with, with the bank. All our digital lending products are in collaboration with banks, the formal banks. Uh, uh, when we do anything on insurance or wealth management, it'll be in collaboration with somebody with the requisite licenses. Uh, we just provide a platform and a channel uh, on it. Uh, as I said, we, we do enable multi thousands, hundreds of thousands of businesses to operate on our platform. Uh, to collect uh, as well as these past funds. Um, the government is one of the biggest uh, partners of ours when you do e-citizen uh, to get your passport, your driver's license, court fines, all that. It's to enable uh, uh, the government to get their funds real time, enable them to, to address issues on corruption. The government offices have closed all their cash offices today in Kenya. Uh, because everything has moved digital. Uh, so we, we, we are partnering, all the county governments uh, are connected to MPES, all 47 counties are connected uh, in one way or another. I think over 27 are, are connected quite well uh, with proper systems uh, in it. And we do see, as we get a lot more data, um, we have to be responsible on protecting customer data. Uh, a lot of people want to use this data, uh, but customer consent is important. There's no way we will give customer data to a third party. It's not possible. Uh, customers must consent uh, and consent uh, to the new regulations. Today, now we are operating with the new regulations that were passed um, with regard to customer protection that we need uh, to follow. So I think it's, uh, there's also GDPR that needs to, uh, win, um, uh, that, that's there. So there's a lot about data uh, that we have, but we're looking, if, if, let me talk about one, which is lending. So there, I mean, lending is unregulated in this market. Um, and it's something that we need to, to start looking at as an industry. And I think that process is starting. The central bank has, is encouraging also us to, to, to discuss with other players. We have an open platform that enables a lot of digital lenders to get um, connected to a platform. But we do have, we can see one customer who has been offered three or four different loans uh, by different, by different uh, service providers. And we, you can tell that this guy will not be able to pay that loan. That, I don't, we don't have the ability to, to, to stop it. Uh, I wish I had, and I told Central Bank, I wish we could, but it, it's, not in our, it's, it's not my mandate. Um, 
and there's no regulation to stop that. But as, uh, and we've seen the Digital Lenders Association being formed, uh, the digital banks also, to, I mean, the banks that do digital lending are now talking together and starting to look at this. We also have to look at how the CRB is structured today. The CRB is structured for proper financial, it's not designed for digital lending. So if you've, if you've got a dollar that you've not paid, you're, you're listed in the CRB. For heaven's sake, man, it should be like $500 and above to be listed in CRB. Come on. I mean, it's, it, it, it is something that we really need to look as, a, as an industry and actually go to central bank and, and propose uh, solutions that actually help address the challenges that, that, that are there uh, in it. But yes, we are open. Uh, we, do, we do provide uh, credit scoring facilities to third parties on consent. Um, we do have several banks and several f uh, fintechs who are using this service. But we'd, we'd like to partner with more people to come in and actually uh, see how you can leverage on this data. But also, as I said, it has to be uh, consented by the customer to be able to uh, use these services. Thank you. I think now I'll open to the floor. I think Tamar, you probably got some questions on Twitter. So some of the questions were around um, what's the role of fintech? How do we ensure financial health? What are the metrics for financial inclusion? Um, how can we get embedded finance and, and formal finance to be more connected? What is the protection of consumers? How do we develop an ecosystem that allows funds to flow into real life problems? Um, what is open finance need in terms of sharing of data? What about the cost of sharing data? And is that restrictive? And then wh where did the growth go? What about inequality? Open finance, but is it enough? And then finally, the, a, a question on climate finance and blended finance. We clearly don't have time to answer all of that. Um, but as I said, you've addressed a lot of those. So maybe, I don't know, in, in, in closing remarks, uh, you could address whichever one um, you've got something interesting to say. So respond to whatever you want. And I do want your thoughts on trends into 2020 next year, what you think is pertinent for your sector, and sort of what do you think you can leverage? And a good example is climate finance. And David, I think we'll start with you. Perhaps if I can pick up the uh, growth and inequality point. Um, and I think I'd like to just link that back to uh, what we were discussing earlier, which is uh, about um, uh, finance for women and finance for young people. I think fundamentally, as a society, we have to invest in young people and women. And um, and we have to find solutions to that, which is why I think it's so incredibly important to look at this as a systems level rather than a sector level, because it isn't really an option not to. We're not, we're not going to make progress in the direction of Vision 2030 if we're not investing in women and we're not investing in young people. And, and that's going to require all the elements of, of the financial system. Now, and I, I don't want to be sort of quite clear, I don't think open finance of itself is a magic bullet. In a sense, it's, it's a direction of travel for, for the system, which I think can help us to discover those solutions. But I think, you know, in terms of focusing on the real problems, um, inequality is, is right up there. And I think, you know, part of tackling inequality is making sure that we invest in the next generation and ensure that half of our human talent is able to, to fully that join in society and the economy. I think I'll tackle the question of blended finance. Um, as David mentioned, that there is a structural problem where just the banking industry on its own cannot fix, and the government would have to step in, and hence the blended finance. Um, I would just suggest a number of ways that our government could possibly um, participate in, in providing access and actually helping bring down the pricing of credit. So a lot of times SMEs cannot access funding because they lack the collateral to do so and because the perceived risk of an SME is very high. So some of the ways that maybe the government could assist, um, and this is actually being done in half the countries in the world, is an access to a public credit guarantee scheme. What that means is that if a bank or a lender is lending to an SME, and the SME uh, ends up defaulting, then a portion of that default is covered by the government for the bank in exchange for a fee, essentially an insurance scheme. 
Um, it's working in half the countries in the world. Um, we don't have it here in Kenya. And it could really help, really help to alleviate some of the perceived risk as we collect more and more data on SMEs and also give them access to credit where there's no collateral. Um, another scheme for uh, SMEs, early stage SMEs, could be borrowed out of the UK where they have an enterprise um, EIS scheme, which is an enterprise investment scheme. To mobilize patient capital, uh, a scheme could be you invest in a startup, some of that portion of that money is offset against your tax bill at the end of the year. I mean, this has been phenomenally successful in the UK. And just last year, they enabled 18 billion pounds of capital to be deployed in startups. Uh, you know, Kenyans don't like to pay, pay tax. I think nobody likes to pay tax. And I think this would be a really, really good, good initiative to mobilize SME financing. Uh, I think as we look into the next year, the areas of interest would be still the green financing, but around the circular economy. Uh, there's a lot of conversations around circular economy, recycling, and, and the issues of waste management, and that space is going to require uh, financing. So what type of financing can come in to fill the gap there? And then also we are watching closely the uh, shaping of the Kenya Development Bank to see how the manufacturing sector is going to position itself to access those funds. We've been having uh, conversations over the last almost two or three years on the possibility of looking at uh, pension and uh, unclaimed assets uh, to also support lending in, in, in government for the sector. So we've done a paper that will be released uh, by the end of the year on, on the same uh, a detailed research paper. Uh, for manufacturing SMEs, still the things I said, uh, trying to see how uh, they can access financing and also partnering with, with KBA through the platforms like Inuka to uh, make that happen. And then lastly, for women in manufacturing, uh, we, we run a program for women, women in manufacturing at CAM uh, because of the reality that the manufacturing sector is quite male dominated. So we've been trying to see how do we get women to participate more in manufacturing and definitely one of the areas that comes out is the issues around financing. We are releasing a study that we have carried out uh, with the International Center on Research for Women. It's the first of its kind study in Africa to understand the statistics behind women in the manufacturing sector in Kenya. And we hope that this data information statistics can be used uh, to make decisions, especially around financing both by government and uh, the private sector uh, towards supporting women businesses to grow through the right type of financing. So that's what the next year looks like for us. Thank Just to touch on what David mentioned and also my sister about credit guarantee schemes. We actually do have credit guarantee schemes in Kenya. I wanted to clarify that record. Um, so we, we have state supported and also um, DFI supported schemes. Um, uh, so, for example, AGRA uh, has a scheme, AGF, African Guarantee Fund, has a, has a credit guarantee scheme. And then currently, um, National Treasury, in partnership with the Ministry of Industries, as we're talking, working on uh, a credit guarantee scheme that will unlock. And I know FSD Kenya uh, is supporting this as well. So I think, I think in terms of government's role in um, really supporting from a policy perspective and bringing the players together, I think we are seeing some, some good action there. But I think my, I'd like to answer the question that was raised about consumer protection. I've seen our friends from Consumer Grassroots Association in the room. It's probably from them. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> uh, Jacob. Um, so, so I'll answer it by talking about the point that David mentioned in his remarks about this issue about enlightened finance. I think, uh, and I'm an advocate for sustainable finance, and the whole premise is that the financial sector has to be responsive to the social, environmental, and, and broader economic concerns. So it's not just about financial returns, it's about contributing to sustainable economic development. And when you look at and really understand that, um, even when you look at our GDP output at the county level, you see that agriculture, for example, is underpinning every single county. So if we're not spending or investing in the agri-sector, for example, which 
um, contributes to probably 70% of employment in our country, then are we really as a financial sector creating long-term value um, uh, for the economy? So I think um, there's the issue of sustainable finance and within that on the social aspect is where consumer protection comes in. I believe that happy customers are, are, are easier to manage than unhappy customers and a happy customer is an informed customer and one that has the financial capability and it goes back to the point that we're raising about financial health. So I think this issue of consumer protection is increasingly becoming an important issue. I know we have the, um, the banking industry charter that introduces the, the regulatory framework at the banking industry level to really address uh, consumer protection issues. We already have the national consumer protection law. Um, but I think it's something that uh, is, is a constant work in progress and we're always engaging with the consumer rights organizations. And, and the final point I wanted to raise is the issue about innovation. Stawi was mentioned. Stawi is a product by four banks, uh, KCB, Co-op, Diamond Trust Bank, and NCBA. Um, it's a loan that's 9% per annum, so that means per year, per 12 months. A lot of the mobile loans are per month, so you can do the calculations. And it's the first time you find viciously competitive firms coming together to offer a product that actually creates value. And, and that's why I was mentioning earlier before, we don't do enough service talking about the amazing innovations coming out of this country through collaboration, through public-private support, um, and obviously leveraging on digital technology. So I think the, the future of enlightened finance is this issue of partnerships, and it's one of the SDGs, coming together to collaborate to create shared value. I'll put my comments in four, four buckets. So financial health first, I think you'll be seeing a lot more on wealth management uh, and insurance propositions coming out. Um, and PESA for all. So today, there are 1.4 million visually impaired Kenyans who use MPESA. So we'll be seeing a lot more products and services uh, geared towards that. Uh, we'll, we're also enhancing services towards refugees. They need to be included. Um, um, enterprises, we'll see, you'll see a lot of innovation and a lot of focus on enterprises in the next uh, uh, coming years. Um, the second bit is on protection. So we're investing a lot on cybersecurity, fraud, AML, KYC. These are pertinent issues, and this can, can impact on the financial health of the country. Uh, so we really need to, to continue investing in, 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 in solutions to ensure that the system is safe and well protected. Uh, the third bit is investment. I know we talk a lot about tech and big tech and AI and uh, the platforms and data sharing. Uh, to be honest, th th these platforms are not cheap. Uh, this, this year, we're going to spend $40 million on M-Pesa. That's $4 billion on, on, on ensuring system stability, scalability, and innovation. Um, it, I mean, I can't even tell you how much we spent on putting the platform on Fuliza. So a lot of this stuff is coming out, a lot of this, even just putting those open APIs out there and making sure uh, we do the developer forums, uh, the agents' uh, support and everything. There is huge amounts of investment, and this is this is underplayed uh, at times when you talk about openness. I think um, we really need to be uh, to to really look at what's the cost of all the success that we're getting. There's investment. There's a lot of hard work. That all the players, I mean, all that has been talked about is happening. So let's not let's not uh, underplay that the investment that needs to go in ensuring that. Um, uh, we continue excelling. Uh, the last bit is partnerships. The growth uh, of this sector is based on partnerships. There's innovation is not a preserve of, of us. Innovation actually occurs within our platform from third parties and not from ourselves. So that's something we're going to continue to embrace and encourage that innovation happens within the platform uh, for the better. And for us, is to ensure the platform system is stable and, uh, and is secure to enable businesses transact on this platform. Thank you. So thank you. I think we're done. Please, can we give a round of applause to our wonderful panel? Thank you, Sitoyo. Thank you, Nuri. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Niha. Thank you, David. I think you can um, go back and take your seats. Um, and I'll now welcome Philippe Masi. He's the Director of Communications for FSD Kenya to give a vote of thanks. And thank you all for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the 2019 um, FSD Public Annual Lecture. 
My name is Philip Masse, and on behalf of FSD Kenya, I wish to express our sincere thanks to Dr. David Ferrand for his excellent insights tonight. I believe that we are all much the wiser after listening to the brilliant insights he has shared with us, and that we are all inspired by his perspective on the next steps towards a more inclusive financial sector. Please put your hands together for the man of the evening, David Ferrand. Thank you, David. Uh, secondly, our fantastic fan, uh, panel, I couldn't picture a better way to imagine the future of finance than to have industry actors share their thoughts with us. Sitoyo Lopokoit, Phyllis Wakiaga, uh, Nuru Mugambi, uh, Neha, Shah, and of course, David. Thank you all for your insights. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> and also to our wonderful moderator, Anzet Sewere. FSD Kenya holds a public lecture every year, and our purpose is to stimulate conversation on current and emerging issues relating to finance. We have seen Kenya's amazing trajectory in terms of growth in financial inclusion. It is now more than clear that we need to take a step further towards promoting more inclusive finance. Inclusive in the sense that it addresses the needs of underserved seg uh, sections of the population. And this includes smaller scale enterprises and lower income households. FSD Kenya is ready to continue to partner with all stakeholders in the endeavor to make Kenya a middle income economy as envisioned under Vision 2030. And for this to happen, the conversation must continue. That is why we are grateful to all of you that came here tonight to listen to David speak, as well as all those who joined the conversation on Twitter. By the way, we picked at number five, but we are fighting against <laughs> really serious uh, hashtags. You know, the politicians as usual, and um, you know what Kenyans like to tweet about. So we thank you, the audience, for, the, for your patience and keenness. Please give a round of applause, a rousing one, to your wonderful selves. So it's officially a wrap. So thank you, good night, take care, and see you again next year.